Welcome ladies and gentlemen to another Bentley Davy Tutors video. Uh, today I'll be taking you through the topic of Earth and Environmental Science at a Year 9 level. As always, if you aren't subscribed already, go to that now and if you enjoy the video, give it a like. I've split up this video into five different sections. Firstly, biotic and abiotic factors. Secondly, food webs. Thirdly, issues as a result of human impacts. Fourthly, various cycles in our world. And finally, a few miscellaneous topics. Hopefully you can learn something or at least remember something you may have forgotten. I have skipped a few bits of information so the video isn't too long like Jeremy's are, so make sure that this isn't your only study resource, and also I may get certain information wrong, so it's a good idea to do your own study and research. So the first topic I'll cover is biotic and abiotic factors. In this section I'll cover four topics. Firstly, and probably the easiest one, and by that even Jeremy could get this, is distinguishing between biotic and abiotic factors. For this, all you need to know is a definition of both, and I assume most of you already know this, so I'll speed over it. An abiotic factor is a non-living condition or thing that influences or affects an ecosystem and the organisms within it. Uh, for example, things such as sunlight, rain, soil and wind. And a biotic factor is a living organism that shapes its environment. And again, some simple examples are different plants and animals. Uh, the second topic here is about measuring abiotic factors. So there are four different factors that you can measure. Firstly, light intensity. Uh, to do this, uh, you can use a light meter. So to, um, to measure light intensity, hold the light meter at the surface of the soil and point it in the direction of maximum light intensity. An error which could occur, which is something Jeremy is likely to do, is to accidentally shade or cover the light meter. The reliability can be increased by taking multiple samples. The second and third factor you can measure is the pH and moisture in the soil. For both of these, you can use a probe. Put the probe in the soil and read the meter. An error which could occur here is not cleaning the probe between samples. Again, reliability can be improved by taking multiple samples with clean probes. The last one is measuring temperature. If you want to measure the air temperature, you can just use a thermometer. And if you're measuring soil temperature, again, just use a probe. Uh, the third section is about how the changes in biotic and abiotic factors can affect the populations and communities in an ecosystem. The values of biotic and abiotic factors in ecosystems have large effects on the population as a whole. Each species has adapted to occupy particular niches. So I have quite a few for both biotic and abiotic. So firstly, we'll go through the abiotic ones. Firstly, light intensity. Light is required for photosynthesis and plant species have evolved for optimum growth in, their light, in the light available in their ecosystem. Secondly, temperature. Animals and plants need specific temperatures to grow healthily and optimally. Uh, thirdly, moisture levels. Uh, animals and plants have adapted to grow at the available moisture levels. Uh, and also plants can die if the levels are too high as water lo logging prevents them from respirating. Uh, and some plants may need lots of moisture to grow optimally, such as bog plants. Uh, thirdly or fourthly, I've forgotten now, uh, soil pH and mineral content. So many plants are quite sensitive to pH levels. Uh, plants such as heathers grow best in acidic soils and plants such as lavender grow be best in alkaline soils. Uh, next is wind intensity and direction. Wind can increase the supply of carbon dioxide to plants, uh, but wind increases the rate of transpiration, which leads to water loss, and also winds can cause mechanical damage to plants. Uh, next is the carbon dioxide levels for plants. Uh, carbon dioxide is required for photosynthesis, so increased concentrations lead to increased growth. Uh, and because CO2 is an acidic gas, increased levels are not suitable for some sensitive plants. And finally, oxygen levels for aquatic animals. Uh, oxygen dissolves in water and is required for animals' respiration. And some animals act as bioindicators, so their presence or absence inform us about the condition of that environment. So now on to the biotic factors. There's only a few here. Um, so firstly, the arrival of new predators. In balanced ecosystems, predators and prey have evolved together. And the arrival of a new predator will disrupt numbers of the prey and other organisms. For example, the introduction of rats to some certain specific Pacific islands has led to the extin extinction of some birds. Uh, next is new diseases. So when organisms are brought into new ecosystems, they often bring new pathogens with them. And finally, there's the case of one species outcompeting another. So newly introduced species can end up outcompeting a native species. And another example is grey squirrels, which are brought to the USA, outcompeted the smaller red squirrel. Uh, the final section in this topic is about the ways which humans have impacted on the biotic and abiotic, fe abiotic features of ecosystems and some potential solutions to these issues. Uh, I didn't want to sweat too much on this, so I have four different problems and a few solution solutions to each one. Firstly, pollution from runoff or disposal of rubbish 
chemical substances or even energy sources such as light and noise pollution. So there's three solutions for this. Uh, firstly, we can make people more educated about recycling. Secondly, we can encourage people to buy biodegradable products. And thirdly, we can reduce the use of pesticides and fertilizers. Uh, the second problem is a land use change. So the, the destruction of land for human activities. And this is bad because it displaces species, reduces available habitats and food sources. Um, two solutions to this are we could promote low impact farming and mining. And secondly, we can teach about land degradation and its problems. Uh, thirdly, introduce species. These have negative effects as new species can outcompete native organisms or displace them. Our uh, three possible solutions are firstly, we can create mechanisms to prevent their introduction in the first place. Secondly, create monitoring systems for detecting new uh, intrusive species. And thirdly, we can move quickly to eradicate new introduced species. Uh, and fourthly and finally, uh, resource exploitation. So firstly, we can use more renewable energy. Secondly, avoid single-use plastics. Thirdly, reduce food waste. And finally, tougher restrictions on overfishing. There's just a few examples of solutions to both. Okay, so the next topic I'll be talking about is food webs. Um, this is a pretty easy section and only has two simple parts. Firstly, you need to be able to extract information from a food web. So I've put an example of a food web in the top left corner and let's see what we got. So from this food web, we can see that foxes and owls are secondary consumers, which means they're at the top of the food chain for this specific food web. The rabbits, mice, grasshoppers and birds are primary consumers, and this means that they consume the producers, but are prey for the secondary consumers. And finally, from this food web, we can see that the carrots, grasses and grains are producers, and this means they provide energy to the primary consumers in the chain. The second section of food webs is about describing the flow of energy. The flow of energy refers to the transfer of energy from the sun and up each subsequent level of the food chain in an environment. At the first trophic level are primary producers such as plants and grains. They use solar energy to produce organic material through photosynthesis. The second level is primary consumers. This section consists of herbivores who use most of their energy to consume, they, most of the energy they consume for metabolic functions such as breathing and eating. The next level is secondary consumers, which is made up of carnivores. Uh, if, and if any other level is present, they would feed on the carnivores who are on the level below. Another group of decomposers such, uh, another group is decomposers such as bacteria, fungi, mold and worms. Uh, and this group breaks down waste and dead organisms. Uh, the nutrients of this is returned to the soil, which is then used by the producers. Uh, and this yeah, makes the loop of the decomposers giving it back to the uh, producers and then the top level consumers end up dying and goes back to the first level. Uh, on a food web, you would find the decomposers below the producers. So the third section is about the human impacts, uh, which the issues that have arisen as a result or have a connection to human activity. And this again has two parts. Firstly, about the greenhouse gas effect, the enhanced greenhouse gas effect and the impact that this has had on our atmosphere. So firstly, the greenhouse gas effect is the way in which heat is trapped close to the surface of the earth by greenhouse gases. This, the enhanced greenhouse effect is the, is the disruption to Earth's equilibrium caused by the increased concentrations of greenhouse gases, which has led to an increase in the global average surface temperatures. Human activities are changing the Earth's natural greenhouse effect. Burning more fossil fuels like coal and oil puts more carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. NASA has observed increases in the amount of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. An increase in these gases causes the atmosphere to trap more heat, heating the Earth as well. Something which can help balance the greenhouse effect is plants. All plants from giant trees to phytoplankton, phytoplankton in the ocean take in carbon dioxide and give off oxygen. However, humans are continually chopping down more and more trees, which is having an even more negative effect. The second section is in, is the human impact, in the human impacts part is about the ozone layer, uh, its depletion by CFCs and the Montreal Protocol. The ozone layer is a layer of the Earth's stratosphere, which has a high concentration of ozone, which absorbs most, most of the ultraviolet radiation reaching the Earth from the sun. CFCs, or chlorofluorocarbons, are any class of compounds of carbon, hydrogen, chlorine, and fluorine, which were typically used in refrigerants and aerosols. They are harmful to the ozone layer because of the release of chlorine atoms on exposure to ultraviolet radiation. Once CFCs are in the atmosphere, they float towards the stratosphere, where they are broken up by ultraviolet radiation. This releases chlorine atoms which are able to destroy ozone molecules, which means they can damage the ozone layer. The Montreal Protocol is an international agreement to address the problem of ozone destruction. 
It was signed in 1986 by more than 70 countries. The set goal is to reduce CFC production by 50%, and this was strengthened by the calls to eliminate them all together by 1996. Significant progress has been made in repairing the Earth's ozone layer, however there is still plenty of work to go. The fourth section is about the cycles in the Earth, and this has again two parts. The first part is about describing the cycling of water, carbon and nitrogen in natural ecosystems. So firstly, the water cycle. The water cycle describes how water evaporates from the surface of the Earth, rises into the atmosphere, cools and condenses into rain or snow in the clouds, and falls again onto the surface as precipitation. Obviously, that is quite dumbed down. For, uh, that's a quite dumbed down version for Jeremy's sake, but you can see the process in the diagram on the left. The carbon cycle is the process in which carbon atoms continually travel from the atmosphere to the Earth and back to the atmosphere. Because our planet and its atmosphere form a closed environment, the amount of carbon in the system does not change. So to put it simply, organic carbon, dead organisms, fossil fossils and fossil fuels, and photosynthesis bring carbon down to the Earth or already in the Earth. Animal respiration, plant respiration, root respiration, and auto factory emissions send carbon back into the atmosphere to be cycled down again. The nitrogen cycle is a repeated cycle of processes during which nitrogen moves through both living and non-living things, such as the atmosphere, soil, water, plants, and etc. For nitrogen to move through the cycle, it needs to change forms. In the atmosphere, nitrogen exists as a gas, but in the soil, it exists as nitrogen oxide. I'm not going to go too in-depth because this is already dragging on a bit for a video of mine at least, uh, and we all know Jeremy basically gives lectures in each of his, but anyways, I would recommend doing your own research if this is something you want to have down pat. There are five stages of the nitrogen cycle. Nitrogen fixation, where nitrogen moves from the atmosphere to the soil. Mineralization, where microbes act on organic material and convert it to a form of nitrogen which plants can use. Nitrification, where the ammonia splits and is converted to nitrates, which can be consumed by any plant or animal which consumes the plants. Immobilization, where microorganisms in the soil require nitrogen as energy, so they pull nitrogen from the soil. And finally, de denitrification, where the nitrogen returns back into the air after bacteria converts nitrates into atmospheric, atmospheric nitrogen. The second part of this topic is outlining the main processes uh, in the carbon cycle. I know this is a bit repetitive, uh, so you can skip ahead a minute or so if you're not interested. So for anyone still here, the first stage is carbon entering the atmosphere as carbon dioxide from respiration and, and combustion. The second stage is carbon dioxide being absorbed by producers to make glucose in photosynthesis. Thirdly, animals feed on the plants, passing the carbon through the different stages of the food chain. Most of the carbon they consume is exhaled as carbon dioxide. Uh, the animals that and plants eventually die, which is when decomposers break down the dead organisms and return their carbon to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide by respiration. Sometimes decomposition can be blocked, which then means the plant and animal material may be available as fossil fuels in the future. And for the final section is just miscellaneous topics that I couldn't figure out what group to put it in. And this has four different sections. Firstly is simply knowing the word equations for respiration and photosynthesis. Uh, I expect everyone to be able to get this because I think even Jeremy knows this. So it is quite simple. Uh, the word equation for respiration is glucose plus oxygen equals carbon dioxide plus water plus energy. And for photosynthesis is carbon dioxide plus water plus sunlight equals glucose plus oxygen. Uh, and for the equals parts, make sure to use an arrow and not an actual equal sign when you're writing it out. Uh, the next section is about comparing renewable and non-renewable non energy. Again, this is quite easy, but renewable energy is a source of energy produced by using natural sources that are constantly replaced and never run out, such as solar, wind, hydro, tidal, and geothermal energy. And non-renewable non energy comes from sources that will not be replenished for an extended period of time, such as fossil fuels, coal, natural gas, and petroleum. The next section is about the renewed interest in controlled fires in some parts of Australia. This renewed interest comes as a result of the devastating bushfires which Australia suffered last summer. It showed that we were not prepared enough and it needed to do more to, prep, to prepare for a fire season. Controlled fires are different from backburning. A backburning is done as a last resort to slow down approaching fires by stripping the ground of vegetation, while controlled fires involve starting fires under controlled conditions to clear out flammable material. They sound the same, but there is a subtle difference. And the final section is about potential strategies for addressing the shortage of fresh water in Australia. Firstly, we could develop water filtration systems. Uh, this can produce purified water, which is free from bacteria and other contaminants to bring clean water to communities. 
The second solution is promoting water-wise habits, such as having shorter showers, installing low-flow toilets, and collecting rainwater for gardens. Uh, these small changes can save hundreds of litres of water per household per week. Thirdly, we could increase water, we could increase water storage in reservoirs. Having bigger and better dams means we can store larger amounts of water and prevent its loss back into the ocean. The final one I've got is desalinating to salt water. This process converts seawater into fresh water, which is suitable to drink and use. This is a growing strategy and could go a long way in reducing water scarcity. Uh, so that's it. If you're still here, thanks for watching. Hopefully you've learned or remembered something or just enjoyed me bullying Jeremy. If you haven't already, give the video a like, subscribe and follow us on Instagram at Bentley David Tudors. Also keep an eye out for a few more videos coming out in the next few weeks while everyone has end of year exams. Thank you.